any action that's done with the motivation of fear mm -hmm. is not going to release as much wisdom and energy as something that's done from the motivation of moving into life. Mm -hmm. So I could be jogging or drinking carrot juice because I'm afraid or because I really want to stay alive. Uh, the Living Dying Project is not so much about dying as it is about transformation of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And it's really been my experience that somebody can meditate for years and years and go through all kinds of psychotherapy. And as long as one is still coming from the standpoint of, I'm doing this because I've got to change. I've got to become a different human being. I've got to self-improve. Mm -hmm. That a fundamental revolution that might be needed to deal with the life-threatening illness has really not happened. Mm -hmm. Whereas at the same time, somebody else can come in and meditate for a f few days and there's some kind of switch that takes place where an opening to God or to the sacred or to the divine or to one's true nature takes place. So it isn't really meditating until your knees fall off, but doing something, whatever it is for you, whether it's being in nature or meditating or being around dying people, but doing something that you can touch that place in yourself that's deeply genuine. Mm -hmm. I don't work with the dying, and whenever I say dying, I certainly don't think people necessarily are going to die, but just people with that life, with that terminal prognosis. I do that not because I'm wanting to help people, not because I'm Mother Teresa in drag, if you will, but really more because it forces me to become fully alive in that situation. If I'm at the bedside of somebody who might not be breathing too much longer, and I'm busy being kind and helpful, and, uh, or on the other hand, feeling helpless that I'm really not touching the person as deeply as my professional self would like, there probably isn't too much opportunity that something's going to change between the two of us. Yeah. And yet that person is probably resonating for me, my own fear of not breathing too much longer, my need to be accepted, and all the things that that person's going through in that extreme situation. Mm -hmm. So it kind of forces me to wake up. It allows me to be deeply honest and outrageous and alive and things like that in the way that a lot of other prof professional situations really don't encourage too much. And in that sense, I would have to believe that your work with the dying is uh, at some level an incredibly uh, compassionate and joyful uh, experience, one in which you get as much out of being with that person as you could possibly offer them. Uh, that's a question with, uh, I think, a rather several answers to it. It mm. isn't always joyful. Mm. I mean, it pushes me again and again in mm. ways where I don't know what to say and I don't feel like I'm a good enough counselor or therapist and I don't mm. feel clever enough or deep enough. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I really do try to again and again come to this encounter with the sense that I'm doing this partly for myself in the sense that I'm with my own process rather than mm. being a helper, and yet at the same time doing it in a way that's as selfless as possible. It's an offering. Yeah. It's uh, given freely so that the patient, the client, is the focus. And in fact, uh, there are a lot of myths about heroes. You would hardly ever hear a myth about somebody who's a helper. You hear myths about doctors who come in and save people because that's a heroic myth. But the myth of being a nurse or a caregiver who's really selfless and there day after day in a really open-hearted way is something you don't hear too much because that selflessness is not something that gives itself to, oh, aren't you a wonderful person, if you will. Yes. Uh, Mother Teresa maybe bridges those two worlds in some ways where she is kind of a hero at the same time as being selfless, but I think she's an exception. Well, you mentioned that at times it's very awkward and sometimes painful for you, and of course it's awkward and painful for the person who's dying as, as well. I, I'm sure there are moments when it isn't easy, and yet it seems to me that 
part of this work must involve for both of you a, a compassion for yourself in the process, accepting the awkwardness and accepting the pain. Yeah, but that isn't, I mean, that's easy to say and I'm mm -hmm. not, I'm not, and I say that to people too, that all it is is accepting and, mm -hmm. and being with yourself. But after having meditated for 25 years and spending more thousands of dollars on therapy that I'd care to admit, uh, I keep finding that there are identity issues, parts of myself that think that are in control, mm -hmm. that become exposed again and yeah. again, that have never really seen the light mm -hmm. of my meditation. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's something about being in a really intense relationship with another human being that uncovers that, whether it's a marriage or being with somebody who's dying, I think it uncovers slightly different parts of our yeah. inner landscape, but uh, just being a alone and trying to work on yourself, I don't think gets to yeah. some of these things we're talking about. And in fact, there w it's almost a fad to work with the dying, if you will, so that one can get on the fast track to spiritual understanding. Mm -hmm. And you're suggesting that there's something unhealthy in that? Well, as long as one has the motivation that I'm going to do this to get somewhere, mm -hmm. what message is that giving to the person who's ill? If I need to get somewhere, if who I am in this moment is not enough, is not a full expression of my being, and you've got this incredible illness, mm -hmm. how much more do you have a problem than I? So really my work is how much can this simple moment, I mean, the thing that's kind of astounded me is that sometimes being with uh, someone who's dying is boring. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's painful, sometimes it's joyful, but uh, again and again, when I think it's got to be different, that is really not meeting that person. They're being drawn inexorably into a place beyond personality, into a, pl a place beyond who you and I think we are as bodies and personalities. Mm -hmm. And if all I'm relating to is how well our personalities are doing together, how comfortable or uncomfortable our bodies are, then the spiritual possibility, the transformative possibility that exists, of course, right now also, is not, is not being met. Mm -hmm.